Good morning. I can see that the strategy here is give a little space in between the economists. So I have Carter come up first, a little break. Okay, we'll bring up another economist. So here I am. Uh, I'm going to start uh, just briefly uh, letting you know where, what part of the Federal Reserve System I'm in. Uh, and I'll be focusing on, on fiscal effects. And when this title was brought to me, I, I thought it'd be interesting to dig a bit deeper into what the effects of investments in early childhood are for government. Uh, but just to give you some background where I'm from, I, I'm in, housed in our Community Development Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, this department is a responsibility for, to promote fair access to credit and economic growth among low to moderate income communities. And we do this through convenings, we provide training, technical assistance, and research. And we happen to have a conference coming up in Washington, D.C. that's going to be focusing on this. Every two years, the Federal Reserve Community Development Department has a research conference. It's designed to bring research uh, together, uh, but to really provide it to policymakers, practitioners, those who are on the ground who can make use of it. So I'm going to leave this slide up here so you can use the bit.ly link to register. Uh, while I make a few more comments here, but if you have any questions about uh, the conference, please let me know. Um, also, the presentation I'm giving today, I've got some new slides in here. If you have comments about them, you know, see me during lunch. I'm going to tweak them a little bit and then make them available to everyone uh, after the conference. And also, my comments today are my own, not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So to begin with, I want to I want to present three key ideas uh, before diving into some of the research. So when we talk about cost-benefit analysis, it's important that we use well-controlled research studies to base that evidence on. And this is we need to have a comparison group, ideally through a randomized controlled trial, but some way that we can compare children who have had access to these programs. We want to look at what we call the counterfactual. You know, what if they did not have access to these programs? What would that situation look like? And then also, this research is in the context of child development science. It's not isolated from this. What we've learned already uh, through earlier speakers today is that this early period is sensitive for development. When you talk about interventions, we understand that this is an important time to make investments. We're using research to really understand what are those uh, most effective investments, how can we do best for children and families? The second, and I'll illustrate this, is to government, and, and broadly speaking about benefits, is that there certainly are near-term benefits that we can see quite immediately, but there's also long-term benefits. And some of these come over time, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Also, the benefits to government cross over a number of different government jurisdictions and agencies. And so there can be challenges to try to isolate some of those savings and benefits to a particular part of government and then advocate from that particular perspective. It's also challenging for elected officials to make investments uh, that can have a broad range of benefits and then also have a long time horizon for those benefits. And then third, that investments that achieve a high return, that they really depend on the quality of the programs, that these are high quality programs, they engage parents, they start early, that when they're scaled, they're effectively scaled. And I'm going to end the talk today by talking a bit about how to match the risk profile of children to get this idea around if we were to really articulate where children are at, what type of investments would make the strongest impact on them, and how could we move uh, forward with that. So to start with, I'm just going to highlight some categories of investments in early childhood. So home visiting, uh, this starting as early as prenatal with a home visitor that works with at-risk expectant families uh, through the birth process, through at least, say, the first year, two, or three of life is one area of investment. Health and nutrition, uh, such as the WIC program, uh, the special supplemental nutrition program for women and children is an example of this type of investment, um, also making sure that children have access to quality health care. Early learning programs, and here I'm encompassing all of those types of programs where children could go, such as childcare and preschool that we've already uh, been talking about here in North Carolina. I have these little um, acronyms next to them, so those will become useful in the next few slides, so recognize those. Uh, quality rating improvement system, which North Carolina has been a leader on, and I, I use this as a placement for investments 
that help support the quality of programs. Of course, with QRIS, we're looking at our early learning programs, our child care system, and, and preschool programs. For parent education, this is more of potentially group-based uh, parent education. Home visiting, of course, is naturally uh, parent education. And interventions that work with the child welfare system. So here referring to uh, interventions that are able to focus on the developmental needs of children who are receiving some connection to the child welfare system. So where do we see uh, some of these benefits to government? And I'll start by saying is that the research that I, I'll be drawing on uh, use, uses a counterfactual. There's, there's some type of control. They're looking at a comparison group. And that speaking you know, generally across these programs, there tends to be three groups of beneficiaries. There are the children and families that benefit. There is government uh, that benefits, but there's also some benefits to non-participants of the program. Let's say if we reduce crime rates, certainly there's reduced costs to our criminal justice system, but there's also reduced crime to victims of crime. So that's one of the benefits. Of these three areas, as I mentioned, we'll be looking closely at the government side of these benefits. So from the literature, uh, from prenatal to age five, uh, there are a number of benefits that accrue quite early from the home visiting literature and also looking at health and nutrition to be able to have better maternal and child health, lower weight births, and fewer emergency room visits. These also translate into reduced costs to Medicaid and TANF and food stamps. Uh, reducing child abuse and neglect can save costs to our child welfare system. Higher maternal earnings, and this would be potentially in the case of both home visiting and with early learning programs where you're supporting the ability of mothers to attain and retain employment. And research studies have been able to show uh, that they've been able to have notable gains in their earnings. This also results in higher tax revenue. Lower cash assistance, uh, and then also lower maternal crime. These can all happen within the first few years of these types of investments. So then we move into school age uh, benefits. So in the school age uh, literature, we see, as we've talked about, some evidence of improving school readiness. Now, school readiness itself is not going to find a line item in a government budget, uh, but you can see some of the results down below. We could reduce special education, reduce grade retention, and so on. One interesting nut to crack, and be interesting to talk about this, is to understand the impact on the productivity of classrooms. Because what happens when we have children who come to classrooms who are behind? A lot of extra resources from teachers are spent trying to help those children catch up, and there's a reduced productivity within that. But I have, I have yet to see a compelling calculation of what those costs are to the K through 12 system. Um, higher high school graduation rates, has been found in the literature, higher education attainment, as I'll talk about in a mo moment, and then also reduced juvenile crime. So these are all different areas uh, where we see from the literature there have been benefits uh, to government. So now we get beyond high school, get to age 18 and older, we have a higher educational attainment levels. This is consistent with higher earnings, and then also some of that, those earnings coming back to the public in the form of high tax revenue lower cash assistance, um, improved health, uh, which can reduce costs uh, to our health systems, lower crime, so reducing costs to the criminal justice system. This includes reduced police protection, court costs, and incarceration costs. Higher ownership rates, too, can have some increased benefit because you can have some higher property tax rates. So we, we look across all of these benefits, and then we ask, so who within government, when government makes an expenditure and an investment, what parts of government are funding these programs? And so I, I have a grid here that lines up these types of investments uh, with federal, state, county, city, and school districts as examples of where there have been investments made in these particular types of areas. And if, I, if you're to walk away from this graph and the next one that I'm going to show you, it is that there is a number of funding streams that are entering into these programs from various government jurisdictions. We don't have the entire uh, boxes filled, uh, but it is certainly a majority. So then we step back and we ask, well, if we're accruing savings 
to government, what parts of government are we seeing some of these reduced costs? So we keep the same levels of government up on top, and we put some of these categories uh, here as well. And we understand that with, with we have improved health outcomes, especially those of birth outcomes, better maternal care, and so on. We could reduce some of the Medicaid costs and also some of the unpaid medical care that happens at county hospitals, reducing some of the TANF costs, the cash assistance costs, uh, where a child welfare system, uh, that draws on from federal, state, and county uh, resources. Of course, some of these more than, than others, but if we can reduce the, the needs of child welfare in that system, we'll see savings across jurisdictions. So the point here is that we have, we see that there are a number of areas of government, then you go within those specific areas, and then you can start talking about agency. Okay, here's the health department, here's human services, here's education within these. So where does this evidence, where does the baseline amount of this evidence comes from? And for the folks in this room, you're familiar uh, with these studies, and so we have Perry Preschool, Abbasidarian, Chicago Child Parent Center, and the beginning of the Nurse Family Partnership Project, which uh, was first studied in Elmira, New York, with the Prenatal Early Infancy Project. And these uh, studies have rigorous research designs, randomized controlled trials in all cases, except for uh, Chicago Child Parent, which uses a quasi-experimental design. Uh, so there could be uh, some concern about selection bias, but they do include a number of controls to account for that. And the economists have come in, they have calculated uh, what those benefits are. In this case, it's all of the benefits um, to individuals, families, to non-participants, to governments. So these are the high line benefit cost ratios. So these ratios are over one. So what does that mean? Getting your return on investment. Uh, we can also look at the annual average rates of return. And you'll note that Heckman is cited in, in the Perry study and the Abbasidarian study as our uh, Abbasidarian study is actually quite le recently released back in December. Uh, often for the research that comes from his studies, it'll look at what is that annual rate of return. So for Perry, uh, up to 10% uh, return, adjusting for inflation, and for the Abbasidarian program, calculating 13% on an annual basis total. So these are the types of returns that in private markets would not sit on the table long. Investors would come along, make these investments, and accrue uh, these types of societal returns. So to step back a little bit and ask, you know, what does it look like in terms of government savings for just a couple of these programs? I'm just going to highlight um, a couple of them. So for Chicago Child Parent Center, um, they provide a list of type of benefits that we can accrue to you know, areas of government. So grade retention, special education, reducing savings to the K through 12 system, criminal justice costs reduced due to the reductions in crime, reductions in child welfare services because abuse and neglect uh, was reduced in this study. Now it's interesting, increased college education costs because you have kids who have better capacity and more capabilities, they're more likely to use public benefits in once they get beyond high school. So this is actually a cost to society. So we put that minus number uh, there. So we add all that up. We take the cost of the program uh, to, the, to the children uh, that were in this program, and then you conduct that benefit cost ratio. And so getting uh, near $3 return uh, for a dollar, every dollar invested to the government. And then to highlight the Almira New York study, uh, the home visiting study here, finding reduced costs to emergency room visits, so comparing the children who were randomly assigned to receive home visiting relative to the control group. Uh, they found a substantial decrease in cash assistance at that time um, and reduced costs to the criminal justice system. The maternal earnings uh, were higher, so they have increased tax revenue. So total, adding up those totals relative to the program costs and finding to government that benefit cost ratio of about four to one. So with this type of research, uh, there has been attempts to isolate you know, some of these benefits to government and to find a way, could we 
bring in some investment money from private markets to be able to make investments in an area within early childhood development and be able to accrue savings to government and even pay back the investor. So this is referring to what? Pay for success. So pay for success is a strategy uh, that has been used in three areas. I'll just mention them briefly. Salt Lake City, Chicago, and, and South Carolina. And in these projects, the way that they are set up is that first of all, there is a feasibility study conducted to determine whether it is possible to find uh, savings in government uh, from making an investment, either in this case preschool or in the home visiting program with nurse family partnership, and to be able to have metrics to declare what uh, would be a cost savings to government, and then with that information, if the investors that have made this, these investments in expanding these programs achieve the, the program achieves those metrics, they can, the government can pay back the money with interest and still save money. So for Salt Lake City's preschool project, they're, they're refocusing on reduced cost to special education and remedial services. To Chicago, uh, kindergarten readiness scores uh, is a metric that's being used in their pay for success project, reductions in special education services and third grade literacy. And this is a combined jurisdiction project with the Chicago Public Schools and with the City of Chicago. So two areas of government stepping in to, f to declare that they have some benefits within their, their own uh, budgets that could benefit from having these uh, results. And in South Carolina, with the Nurse Family Partnership, the expansion in that state to reach 3,200 uh, more at-risk first-time mothers in pregnancy to reduce uh, preterm births, reduce hospitalizations and emergency room visits and the costs associated, increase in healthy spacing between births and also increase in mothers served in high poverty areas. And so these are also metrics that are used to determine uh, whether the investors in that project uh, would get paid back. But at the end of the day, we recognize that investments uh, here uh, continue on uh, going further. So, uh, so it does argue to think about how do, uh, as a society, we just make these investments have these long-term uh, results. I'm going to turn to what are, what are some key principles for investing in achieving these high returns. So what has been consistent across this research? These are themes that have been mentioned already. Importance of quality, so effective, uh, well-trained teachers, uh, and home visitors, research-backed curriculum, well in center-based programs, relatively low ratios of children to teachers, and engaging parents. That when we have families engaged, we see that that is a consistent amount, uh, consistent feature that is consistent with child outcomes. Starting early, so our continuum of investments are as early as prenatal, uh, going up through the early grades, so that we're understanding that continuity uh, between children. Uh, who are coming to the school system and being able to transition into those early grades and achieve that third grade literacy mark. And then finally, matching services to risk profile. Now often in a talk at this point uh, to a more general audience, I would just say it's important to target these resources to our most vulnerable children, and that is very true. But I'm going to be a little more nuanced in my comments, and that is if we can match the services to the risk profile of the child, from an economist standpoint, this is where we will find the strongest benefits because children who come in with highest risk may have need for higher cost services, but we recognize and we see through evidence that reaching these children early and providing them the services and supporting their families can have a very strong uh, high rate of return. On the other end, we recognize that there are families uh, more middle income families who do struggle to pay for some of these services on the margin on a per child basis uh, providing these services to their children is going to be lower potentially than our high risk children but it does argue for providing some benefit on the margin to those parents and families so that they are accessing quality let's say quality child care preschool services early learning programs because if so on the margin that would be a benefit to society to have that resource available. And if you think, and if you step back, you know, what is a sector 
of our society, of, of our system, that on financial need base uh, does this and has this as a programmatical way of approaching uh, financial need, and that's higher education. So in higher education, we have formulas to be able to understand here's the financial need of a particular family, here's some resources to match those needs. Higher need families receive more in packages of grants and loans and so on. Families that have lower need have, have less. So what if we were to bring some of this thinking into you know, early learning? So in Minnesota, we have adopted um, this type of thinking in higher education, bringing it into early learning. And so it's called Minnesota Early Learning Scholarships. Started as a pilot project that was invested by local business leaders uh, in Minnesota who raised $20 million to invest in our state's pilot project for quality rating and also to a uh, scholarship pilot to test this particular model. In our quality rating system, we have a four-star uh, system, so programs that can reach that three to four stars are qualified to receive these scholarships. Eligibility is children age three and four, 185% uh, of poverty and below. But then the state is looking at how to match resources relative to risk profile and with the scholarship fund to be able to use scholarships to bring them to more high risk families. So in the case of teen moms, um, be able to provide scholarships uh, so that their children uh, could receive a scholarship as early as birth um, up until kindergarten age. A county in Minnesota has started to augment the scholarship fund, recognizing that some of their largest costs in their county budget is in foster care. And they are now targeting their own scholarship dollars to children who are in foster care so that they can access high quality early learning programs. And there is a current state proposal um, to provide scholarships to children who are from birth through two, who are homeless, or who have a connection, contact with the child welfare services, um, who are in foster care. And this, the idea here is to think about how to really reach those most at-risk children where potentially you would find the highest uh, rate of return. Uh, so with that, there's some sources for you. You can check that out online when I get these slides up there and my contact information. So I look forward to uh, discuss seeing you during the, during the day. Welcome to receive comments about this presentation. And I wish you the best of luck here in North Carolina. You're doing great work in this state and uh, look forward to hearing uh, all the great things you're doing this afternoon.